Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. While our doors may be shut for the time being, we still want to provide you with that little sneak peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. We'd love to hear from you guys at home as well, so if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comments section and we'll come to as many as we can in the time we've got. And I know that there are lots of really important conversations and actions going on right now about the important social issues that we're discussing at the moment, but that doesn't mean that we should stop caring about our planet as well as the people around us. Today, we're going to be finding out about the complex community of coral reefs, as well as the threats they face and how we protect them. To guide us on this underwater journey, we've got Ken Johnson, who studies these fascinating organisms at the museum. Hi, Ken. Hi, Galil. Hi, everybody. So why don't you start us off by uh, letting us know, what do you do here at the museum? Well, I'm a research scientist. I, I work on coral reefs. I take advantage of our incredible collections that have been built up over the last several hundred years to try to understand how coral reefs function, what's the diversity of life living on reefs. And I'm, I'm more of a historian. I like to look at things in the past and see if we can learn from lessons from the past. For example, how coral reefs have responded to previous environmental changes to try to help predict how they might respond to the ongoing and future environmental changes. So before we delve into this, uh, this issue, we should probably start off with Quite a fundamental question. What are corals and, and how do they form these reefs? Well, here's a picture of a coral, both a colony far away and a close-up of picture. Now, corals are, are animals. They're, they're related to jellyfish or, or sea anemones, but they're very special animals because they're actually able to make a limestone skeleton. So imagine a sea anemone that can make a limestone skeleton. And this limestone oh. skeleton builds up and creates reefs. I think we have also another even closer image of some of these uh, what are called polyps, which are the individual little uh, little anemone type buds of, of coral. That's right. Um, corals are corals are colonial species. So when a coral is a baby, it's a single free living larval larvae that swims around in the ocean. And when it finds a place where it wants to live, it settles and starts to make a skeleton. As it grows, once this polyp reaches a certain size, it buds a new one and a new one and a new one. So a giant coral is tens of thousands of individual polyps, which are all genetically related to one another. They're all clones. So it's an incredible colony of life growing together to make small things growing together to make very large structures. And each coral would be a group of these individual polyps. And then lots of those corals together, sometimes different species will form whole reef as we can see in this image here. That's right, in there we can see lots of different kinds of corals. They have different colony forms, they have branching ones that make bushes, there's ones that are called massive, they make sort of round boulders, there's others that make plates, and all of this diversity of, of life builds this limestone skeleton which makes the framework which is a three-dimensional structure of a reef. And we've already got a question coming in from the audience. Um, we've got Cade has asked and this really fits into what we're talking about right now, actually. Um, if corals are such a diverse group of organisms, Cade wants to know, how many species of coral do we know of? I think there's about 3,000 species that we currently know, but new ones are being discovered all the time. Yeah, and I guess, you know, because they live underwater and they live in all sorts of uh, different kind of places in the world, we're constantly discovering new species. And that leads us on to our next point as well, actually. Where? And you know, where can we find coral and coral reefs? Obviously in the water, um, but, but whereabouts in the world? Well, <clears throat> there's two sort of general kinds of corals. There's the corals that build reefs. And these corals typically live in very warm water, warm like in tropical water. And it's also thought to be often clear water. So they live in the tropics. They live in the Caribbean, they live in Southeast Asia. I mean, the most famous reef of all is the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. So they live in, in warm tropical water. There's another group of corals that don't make reefs. They live in deeper water and, and they can live in the Arctic and the Antarctic in very cold water. So there's sort of two different kinds of, of corals, but the reef building ones that we're most interested in here only live in tropical warm waters. 
Um, and we've got another question about uh, corals as well. This one from Jonah um, is asking, do they eat? And if they do eat, what do they eat? And how do they eat? Well, that's really interesting because corals, they do eat. I mean, just like jellyfish, you saw in the picture where they had tentacles and they can grab things from the sea, from plankton, small animals living in the water, and then they put it into their mouth. So they, they do eat other life. But more interestingly, what makes reef corals super interesting is they're, they live in symbiosis. So corals are animals, but inside their bodies, they have single-celled algae, teeny microscopic plants. The plants live in the coral animal. They're plants, so they take sunlight and create food, and they feed the animal. The animal creates animal waste, which fertilizes the plants. So corals that make reefs are essentially farmers, except their crops grow inside of their bodies. So they're, they're both farming their own food from the plants living in their bodies, but then they are also able to eat things by catching it from the water. So it's a really good question. And just, just like any farm, it's not just the, the, the farmer and the thing that they're farming that lives there, but a whole a host of other organisms that, that inhabit this reef. Uh, That's right. I mean, what we find on coral reefs. I mean, something like a quarter of the species of animals that live in the sea live in coral reefs. And this is because of their skeletons building up these complicated three-dimensional structures provides lots of places for things to hide. Imagine you're a little fish and you're living on a sandy sea bottom and a big fish comes along. What are you going to do? Well, you're in trouble. But if you're living on a coral reef, you can swim into one of the colonies and hide out and not maybe not be eaten by the big fish. So it's this three-dimensional structure that coral reefs build up that, that creates habitat for an incredible diversity of life. They've been called the sort of cities of the sea before because they have big three-dimensional structures and lots of diversity and lots of life living in them. Yeah, and we can see from, uh, from this slide here that yeah, they support all sorts of, of life from these, you know, little conch uh, snail mollusks on the, on the top left, all the way through to, you know, big predators like reef sharks and all of these different levels of the food web interact with each other in, in all sorts of different ways. That's right. Everyone always likes the fish, but most of the diversity are things that are in the invertebrates and the crustaceans like crabs and shrimps and mollusks, snails and clams are incredibly diverse on coral reefs. And, and that there are three them they're complicated uh, ecosystems with food webs and all sorts of things um, sort of working together to build like an ecosystem the ecological interactions are incredibly complicated and incredibly tightly controlled on a coral reef and there must be some organisms on a reef that eat the coral itself right and um sophie is asking whether once a coral is damaged can it regrow Yes, I mean, because they're, they're colonies, if they say break it in half, you end up with two colonies and they can continue to grow. So in that way, they're sort of like plants. You imagine like a strawberry plant. If you break it and plant it, you can get multiple individual plants. So corals, if they get damaged, can definitely regrow. And some of them actually kind of, that's how they get bigger is they break and then they continue to grow. Wow, fascinating. So uh, coral reefs, are not just kind of hotbeds of biodiversity in themselves though, they, they also interact with the, the rest of the ocean ecosystem and, and the world ecosystem, right? Yeah, yeah, they're incredibly important. I mean, there's some fish that live on coral reefs, but also live out into the open ocean during different times of their life. And so they, they do interact with the rest <coughs> of the ocean in various ways, yeah. And, you know, we don't just depend on coral reefs for, you know, supplying the, the, the ocean with fish that we eat. We also depend on them for a lot more things as well, don't we? Yeah, I mean, hundreds of millions of people live near coral reefs and depend on them for their economic benefits. It's called their ecosystem services. So yes, we, they do provide important fisheries for local people living near coral reefs, but they also provide uh, economic benefits associated with tourism. Lots of people like to dive on coral reefs because they're such beautiful and diverse and active places. And so you, the, the local economies benefit from the dive tourism. But 
probably one of the most important economic benefits and, and benefits to humanity of coral reefs is the coastal protection they provide. Because the coral skeletons are made of limestone and they build up from the sea floor, they essentially create a wall along the coast. And you can imagine if there was a storm wave from a hurricane or a tsunami and it was coming up towards the coast, if it hits that wall, its energy decreases and it doesn't flood the coast as much. If the coral reef wall is not there, the flooding on land becomes much, much stronger and creates incredible amounts of damage. Yeah, we've all seen the, the damage that tsunamis and flooding can cause to coastal communities on the news and stuff. So imagine what that would be like if we didn't have any reefs at all. It may seem a bit weird to some of our audience to, <clears throat> to look at such a kind of a, a natural organism community uh, as, a, as a coral reef and think of it in terms of economic benefit um, and sort of cost benefit analysis and stuff. Um, but it's also a useful tool for getting governments and, and business and stuff on board with protecting these, uh, these ecosystems as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it, other than their just inherent beauty and, and, and understanding the complexity and the diversity of life in the coral reef ecosystems, it's important to recognize, you know, there is money involved. And there have been studies by economists coming up with, with values of, you know, hundreds of billions to even trillions of, of U.S. dollars as the sort of global value of, eco, of coral reef ecosystems. So they're equivalent to the, if the gross domestic product of some of the largest economies in the world. You know, so coral reefs are incredibly important in providing these services and it's a great way of, of quantifying it so you can convince people, you know, don't just protect these things because they're beautiful and really amazing. You have to protect them because they benefit people as well. Yeah, I think, I, I guess it's a, that's a really interesting example of how the kind of uh, economic and, and political aspect of how we interact with nature uh, butts up against the the intrinsic you know biological and ecological value of of something like a coral reef and that stuff is under threat at the moment right um, so we've, we've got a whole range of different things that are causing long-term and short-term damage to, to coral reefs. We've, we've seen this in the news for, for several decades now. Coral reefs are in decline worldwide. Some people have estimated that as many as a quarter or a third of coral reefs worldwide have already perished. Um, and there's two, there's different kinds of threats to coral reefs. There's ones that occur on a local scale. So things like overfishing. So if you catch too many fish from the reef, the, the way that the ecology functions changes. Um, and, and this can create problems for the reef ecosystem. There's other impacts such as invasive species. This is where a, a, a species that comes from one place gets introduced into a place where it isn't normally found. For example, lionfish. Lionfish are common in the Pacific, but they never lived in the Caribbean until about a decade ago. And now they've all of a sudden started appearing in the Caribbean, probably coming from someone's aquarium system. And they eat all of the other fish and they're, nothing can eat them because they have venomous spines sticking out of them. So these invasive species can change the ecosystems. Other local impacts are things like uh, um, crown of thorns. This is a predator which eats corals. It's quite interesting, it's a um, sea star. And the way it eats them is it gets on top of the coral and it sticks its stomach out of its mouth and digests the coral and then sucks its stomach back in its mouth. These, Excellent table manners. Fantastic. These, this species becomes very, very abundant in some places for, for <coughs> unknown reasons. And then it eats corals and then it disappears again. So, so these are a lot of the kind of more local threats, but there are some much more global and, and long-term uh, dangers to coral reef. Yeah, and that is, of course, global warming. The heating of the, of the earth due to putting um, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere as a result of human activities. And this creates very different environmental conditions in the sea. The water can be much, much warmer than usual, right? So here's a, a map showing uh, bleaching. Warm water create, causes coral bleaching. And here's a map produced by NOAA in the US about the potential for bleaching this summer. And we can see that in various parts of the world, in Southeast Asia, um, in Brazil, there's a very high likelihood of bleaching happening sometime in the next few months.
due to warming. So you, you mentioned coral bleaching, um, and some of our audience might be familiar with that term, but let's let's break it down. <clears throat> a little bit. Yeah, what I mean, bleaching. When you talk about coral bleaching. Bleaching is a phenomenon that's becoming increasingly common on coral reefs. Um, what it is, is is a breakdown of the symbiosis that a coral and its plant symbionts, that the microscopic plants living inside of its body. So the coral animal has plants living inside of its body and they're working together, feeding one another. But if the temperature gets a little bit warmer than, than usual, the plants get a little bit too happy and they start photosynthesizing more and that produces oxygen, right? Because plants take carbon dioxide and they turn it into oxygen as part of their photosynthetic process. The oxygen actually damages the tissues of the coral animal, right? So the coral animal says, whoa, I can't have these plants in me anymore, and it ejects them. And then that creates a white color because actually the color of a healthy coral is mostly because of the plants living inside of it, not the animal. So, so in, this image, in these images here, these white areas are all bleached and they will- so that, that would be a coral colony. They might still, still be alive, but they've had to eject all of the, the plants that were living inside of them. And so you can see the skeleton underneath. The animal itself is, is transparent. And all you see is the skeleton looking through the animal. And I think this is a really interesting example of, um, of how anything can be a poison. Because you said that it's because the plants are producing too much oxygen. And normally you would think that an animal that had a plant producing oxygen inside it would be great. We need oxygen for animals to live. But if the levels of oxygen get too high, like you were saying, it goes from being something that helps us live to being something that damages the tissues. That's right, all these things have to, these, these symbiosis, species living together rely on a balance of processes. So things that are good in, in moderation, if in excess, can become quite dangerous. And we've got an interesting question from, uh, from Andrew, one of our, uh, one of our viewers. Um, and Andrew was saying that uh, he was fortunate enough to, to swim on the Great Barrier Reef uh, last summer. And he was, you know, he was really shocked to find out about the amount of bleaching. And he was wondering if the reduction in human travel and activity that's, that's come from the, the recent lockdown, would you think that will have helped uh, mitigate some of these, these impacts and help to help recover? Or is it too short term for that to happen yet? Um, certainly it might help mitigate some of the local impacts if, if the dive operations aren't done in a sustainable way, in a way that keeps the local ecosystems intact, then having fewer people out there touching the corals or walking on the corals may well protect them. Um, in a global impact, yes, certainly we're producing fewer greenhouse, less greenhouse gas at the moment. So, but it's a long-term trend and we'd have to probably not fly a lot, never for a long time in order to get that trend to actually decline. I think so. So the local effects, yes, the, the global warming effects are a much bigger problem and only a few months of, of reduced airfare, air travel, I don't think is decreasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere significantly. Um, we've got another question from one of our viewers who's uh, it's asking, once a coral has bleached and it has expelled its, its plant symbiote, uh, what, what's its lifespan after that likely to be? I mean, compared to its normal lifespan, if it kept it's uh, kept its plants. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how warm the water is, partially. You know, if it gets really hot, then the, the animal will die more quickly. But I think they can only live a few weeks or maybe up to a month without their symbionts. And what they're, what they're doing in that state is they're looking for other symbionts, other algae in the water that they maybe can, you know, take work with. And so there's a few weeks where they stay alive. And then if they don't get a new symbiosis set up, they starve to death. Okay, so what? So that's that's really not a sustainable, uh, not a sustainable way way for them to live. Just trying to hunt from the outside. And what what are some other of these big global threats um, to to coral reefs? Well, putting putting CO two in the atmosphere also changes the chemistry of the ocean water. It makes it slightly more acidic. So this is called ocean acidification. Of course, if you know about, um, well, here we see a picture of adding CO two. This is a a measure of the CO2 concentrations measured on the top of Mauna Loa volcano this is done by the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And they've been measuring it there since the late 1950s. So a guy named Dave Keeling put this experiment up and they've been measuring 
actually the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere ever since. And we can see, well, we all know this, it's been going up a lot even since the 1950s. Yeah, and you know, this is just over the last few decades. And if we go to, go to the next image, we can see over the last few centuries, it's actually mainly been you know, increasing much, much faster in, in, in more recent uh, in the 20th century, right? And so this is showing uh, data from ice cores in Greenland and comparing it with the data actually directly measured in the atmosphere. And we can see that at least since the 1700s, we've had nothing anywhere near the increases that we've had since 1950. And if we look uh, further back for even more context, we're going a few thousand years back now. And you can tell yeah. that it's, you know, we've had ups and downs in the, in the levels of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere and, and in the ice cores, but it's only very, very recently that it's taken such a dramatic spike and increase. It's been an incredibly rapid change um, to the, the atmospheric chemistry, and it's having impacts on the oceans and and life everywhere on Earth. In fact, yeah. So, what impact does this have on the on coral itself? Well, other than the warming, there's this ocean acidification factor, which I was discussing. Um, corals have a limestone skeleton, and Acid and limestone don't agree, right? If you if you want to dissolve some limestone, you put some vinegar on it and it dissolves. And so in, in oceans that are slightly more acidic, it's harder to make skeleton. The corals have to have more energy to expend more effort into building their skeletons. And so we look at this model of how ocean acidification is going to change in you know, this century. There's lots of places where the corals probably won't be able to grow very fast, if at all. So it's not looking good. So how does your research fit in with uh, kind of assessing and evaluating these, these threats to coral? Well, like I say, I work on the history of things. I'd, I'd like to look and see how corals have responded in the past to environmental changes. And we can do that by looking at historical records of various types. You know the saying, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so the idea is, can we learn something by looking at past responses to help us manage ongoing responses. So how do you study the coral without damaging it? Well, we have different ways. We have very nice collections here at the Natural History Museum in London. We have collections that were made from over the last 200 years from coral reefs all around the world. And they're held in our collections and we can study them to see what conditions were like in the past. We can see what species were living on different reefs in different places, but we can also look at the ecology of the corals by analyzing the, the specimens themselves. One technique we've recently been using is CT scanning. So this is some work done with my colleague, Beck Summerfield and Erica Hendy at uh, Bristol University. And we CT scan, which is like doing x-rays of coral colonies. And we can see on this coral, which was collected um, from the Chagos Archipelago in uh, 1904, we can see on the right hand side, corals have growth bands. They have density bands, sort of like tree rings. And so you can see how fast the coral was growing in the past. Oh, and on the, the left hand side, you can see that there's lots, well, you can see there was lots of things living inside the coral colony. So worms and sponges and things. And so we can study the associated biota and get some idea of how healthy these reefs were in the 19th century. So if you want to know how healthy reefs were in the 19th century, you come to our collections and we can do that for you. It's amazing what detailed information we can get just, you know, using these techniques that we wouldn't have had access to a few decades ago. Yeah, we can use these new techniques on our old specimens. It's really, really exciting. It, it's one of the reasons that, coral, that museum collections are so important because you wouldn't even imagine the things that are going to be possible, the new analytical techniques, when they collected these things in the 1850s, they really couldn't possibly imagine what we can do with them now. And so, and imagine what we'll be able to learn from them in 20, 30 years. We can exactly. use and that's technique. critically important that we maintain collections and museums because they really are important repositories of history. And uh, how back do our collections go? Because you're you're pretty into fossil corals, right? Yeah, I, I am a paleontologist. Actually, I'm, I'm one of those rare paleontologists who. How can I say it? I, I don't really think dinosaurs are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Blasphemy. <laughs> but corals are incredible because they, they're preserved very well and they're very, very common. So um, 
when they grow as a reef, they basically build their own tombs. And you can go back and you can sample the fossils. Here's some fossils from the Coral Triangle region of Southeast Asia. And you can see what corals were there, who were they living with, how fast were they growing, were they you know, dying back and suffering some stress. And so you can basically do almost the same ecology on the fossil corals as we can do on the modern corals. And this so is a project, the go on. So you, you mentioned the coral triangle just then. Um, could you tell us what that is? Well, this is a region in, uh, including Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea. It's, it's the most diverse marine ecosystems on earth. So it's a global biodiversity hotspot. There's more species of corals and other marine life living there than anywhere else on earth. And Do we know why? No, we don't know why. And some years ago, we decided to try to figure out why. And for me, as a paleontologist, if you want to understand why a place is incredibly diverse, you have to understand its history. Is it, how long has it been diverse for? Has the diversity, hmm, I'm getting a phone call. Has the diversity- <laughs> yeah, I'll get so <laughs> Got it, okay, so. <laughs> Has the diversity changed through time? Has it gotten more diverse, less diverse? So we have to look at the history of the Coral Triangle. And we set up a big project um, funded by the European Union. And we hired a team of 11 early stage researchers and went out and collected the fossils of the region. And we found out that the Coral Triangle region has been diverse for at least 20 million years. And the species living 20 million years ago in the region are still alive today. So there's been no extinction. In other parts of the world, for example, the Caribbean, there was a mass extinction event two million years ago and half of the species went extinct. So it's much less diverse there. But the corals in the Coral Triangle don't seem to be suffering from extinction. And so once a species gets there, it just stays and they add up and they get more and more species through time. So the question is, why? What is it? What's so special about this region that extinction doesn't happen? And what is so special about the Coral Triangle? Well, if you look at a lot of our collections from there, the, the corals are living in places where there, there's a lot of mud, okay? The Southeast Asia, well, there's some modern ones. Southeast Asia, of course, has lots of volcanoes. It has lots of mountains, but it also rains a lot. And so there's lots of stuff getting into the water. And the coastal waters of the area are often very, very turbid. There's a lot of stuff in the water. So here you can see some pictures from um, Malaysia, from Sabah, showing some turbid water reefs we've been currently working on. And, you know, there's lots of corals there, but the water isn't clear. You imagine, most people, when you think of coral reef, you imagine like a crystal clear turquoise water, palm trees on a sandy beach. Well, in a lot of places in the Coral Triangle, the corals are living in these muddy places where the, the visibility is quite low. So do you think the, the muddy water might be protecting them from bleaching? Well, there, there is a hypothesis that bleaching, of course, is caused by increased temperature but also might be impacted by the amount of light that the corals have shining on them because they get sunburned. And I guess if, if the issue is the, the, the plants producing toxic levels of oxygen, uh, you know, light falling on plants causes them to photosynthesize, they produce oxygen. So if the water is cloudier, maybe the plants won't produce such elevated levels of oxygen. Indeed. Uh, poison the corals. And there's been lots of studies looking at sort of the deeper parts of Clearwater reefs. So if you go down 50 meters, there's still corals down there, but the light is much lower because as you go deeper in the water, the light gets filtered out, right? So there's been lots of evidence suggesting that the deeper parts of, of Clearwater reefs aren't bleaching when the tops of the reefs do bleach. So we're thinking turbid water will have the same effect, but at shallower depths. You only have to go down 10 or 15 meters and the light levels are quite low because there's so much muck in the water. So what are you studying in exactly? Like how, what are you, what are you trying to measure and, and deduce? With well, we work? have one project going on now in Malaysia and Sabah, and this is with our colleagues at the uh, University of Malaysia and Sabah, and my colleague Nadia Santo Domingo here at the Natural History Museum. And what we've been doing is we've gone out to these reefs and nobody really has ever studied them because well, they're muddy places. Why would you go diving somewhere where it's not, you know, crystal clear? So we've been mapping out the corals that are living there, looking to see how many species there are, how much cover is there. And we've also been deploying um, instruments with, to measure light and temperature. And these on the, on the left there, you can see our sed traps. So those are 
traps that catch sediment. And we put them out, we go back a year later, and then we see how much sediment has come down as a measure of how turbid the waters are. We also deploy instruments from the boat to look at light profiles with depth and to see what is the quality of the water, how much light is getting down to the bottom. So we're, we're basically exploring these unexplored places for the first time because there's been very little research on these areas because everyone wants to go to the Clearwater Reefs. These are sort of non-typical or they often call them marginal habitats. And, and their importance, I think, has been underestimated over the years. And I guess if the water is cloudy, then, you know, people don't want to go there to snorkel or scuba dive. And that might, you know, reduce some of the human impact on it. Because we've got a question uh, from Sophie asking if stuff like scuba diving does have an impact on, on coral reefs. Well, it can do, depending on how the diving is managed, right? If you have people that are very experienced divers and they're well trained and if you touch a coral, you can damage it. So you, you, you can't go and stand on it because you'll damage it. If, if the impacts are very well managed and there are sustainable dive operators that are very, very good at this, the impacts can be minimized. And uh, we've had a few questions as well uh, asking whether we know much about the impact of plastic pollution, um, either micro or macro plastic pollution on, on coral reefs. Um, this is an area of very active research, as you can imagine. And, and in our dive sites in Malaysia, there's there's lots of plastic because some of them are quite close to a town where there's you know lots of stuff getting into the water. And it's definitely an area of active research for us that we're doing, trying to see what is the impact of places where there's lots of plastic and are the corals still healthy versus places where there's less plastic. And this is one place where our historical collections can be quite useful. Because if we have things that were collected in the 1850s, there ain't gonna be any plastic in them. And so if we can look at those and then look at things that are growing in a similar place today with the plastic, we can see if there's any differences. Yeah, again, one of the, one of the really valuable things about such, having such an extensive historical collection. Um, and we've also getting quite a few people asking, following on from, from these questions, what about, you know, what about the future? What can, what can we do either as individuals or as a larger society to help protect the coral reefs? Well, what I'm doing is trying to find places that might be refugia, refuges. So if the clear water reefs are, are not being very um, successful at the moment, we need to identify the places that are likely to survive and, and get them protected. So that, you know, and here's a map showing lots of marine, large marine protected areas in the world. And this is increasing. And this reduces the, the local impacts by not having, you know, fishing going on in there. As individuals, I mean, we really need to work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You know, that's, and, but it's a big problem. It's, it's a big problem. And we know from the last few years, there's been coming increasing awareness of this. So things like international flights, things like eating meat, you know, we have to reduce our carbon footprint, but it's, it's not a problem that's easily solved by individual choices as much as large international systems. So I think right now we need to really focus on finding the places that have a chance of surviving, protecting them from local impacts as best we can, while the more global thing takes place over the next couple of decades. Well, yeah, I, I guess it's 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 hard trying to to have uh, trying to trying to have positive environmental effects as an individual, whilst also being part of this really big system and feeling like actually you don't make a difference on your own. But you know we can't make a difference with these uh, in these big systems, the like economic and political systems, without each of us putting in our own effort. Yeah. Um, I've got more about it. I mean, having the knowledge to understand what's happening, I think is very important. And that's why I'm very excited to work at the Natural History Museum where I get a chance to actually talk to people. It's really great. Yeah, and that, that's why we really appreciate uh, you, you know, coming on here and, and us being able to have these kinds of dialogues um, you know, with our audience in the museum and also our audience out on the internet now in lockdown. Um, we've got a few more questions as well uh, that, are, that are more about people's curiosities about the, the corals themselves. Um, someone's been wondering, uh, how do corals reproduce? Because uh, that's really interesting. they're all just sitting there in a colony. Well, <clears throat> they, they make sperm and eggs. 
And depending on the species, sometimes there's females and male colonies are separate. So on other species, the males and females are together in the same colony, so they're called hermaphrodites. And what they do is they release their sperm and eggs into the water, into the sea where they fertilize one another. And then you get a larva that finds somewhere to settle, settles and then starts building a colony. So their early life stage isn't on the ground, on the seafloor at all, but it's out in the water. And I guess if they're you know, producing so many millions and millions and millions of uh, sperm and eggs at one time, um, um, a lot of those larvae must not make it to adulthood, right? Probably. I mean, but a more interesting question is, how do you time the release of the gametes? Because if you're going to release gametes into the water, you're going to hope that some of your neighbors are doing it at the same time in order for it to be successful. And so in many briefs, they have what they call mass spawning events, where the gametes are released by lots of different species all at once at the same time. So you can have... You know, on the fourth night after the new moon in September, all of the corals release their gametes at the same time. They're all on the same WhatsApp group. And mass spawning events can, they can be feeding bonanzas for, you know, lots of different types of fish and, and other organisms that live on the reefs. Yep. But, but so many larvae are produced that some of them don't get eaten. That, you know, they sort of flood the, the, the sea with food. The fish all eat their fill and then there's still something left over. I, I, and that's a, a lovely example of uh, the idea that, you know, if you're an organism trying to reproduce, you can either go for, you know, a strategy like a, like a whale where you make, you know, one or maybe two big offspring and you look after them loads for a long time and make sure they get to adulthood. Or like a coral, you make millions and millions and millions of offspring and just roll the dice and hope that some make it through. Yep, exactly. Um, we've got a, a lovely question here. Uh, someone's asked, uh, oh, Alex has asked, Ken, what's your favorite coral species? Oh, it's difficult. You know, it's like asking, which is my favorite daughter? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm quite fond of a species that lives in the Caribbean called Manicina areolata. It's called Ooh, what does that look like? It, it, it's a small brain coral. I studied it for my PhD, so I spent a lot of time with them. The cool thing about it is, so I've talked about how corals live attached to the sea floor and build up big colonies. Well, Manicina doesn't live attached at all. It's, it's what they call a free living coral. So it's not attached to the bottom. And if it gets rolled over, it can roll itself back over again. If it gets buried in sand, it can dig itself up out of the sand again. So it's actually mobile and it lives how on... Yeah. How does it manage to move itself? It doesn't have limbs, does it? Well, it, it, if it's rolled over, what it does is it, so corals have a, it's a brain coral and it has this big stomach and it fills itself up with water and then it blows the water out of its mouth to create a jet and it sort of rocks itself over again. That's amazing. If, you, if ever you needed any evidence that corals are animals and not just weird living rock type things, there you go. It can vomit itself out of the floor. Exactly. <laughs> um, we've got uh, another question asking, do we have any uh, coral reefs in the waters around the UK? Well, this is a very, how do I put it? Some people think it's controversial because yes, we do have corals in the UK and, and off the west coast of Scotland, living in, in the cold, deepish water there, there's lots of corals. Not many different species, a few different species, but they do build up limestone platforms. So, but they're not at all like the tropical coral reefs because the corals living on them are not symbiotic. They don't have the plants living inside of them. And they don't actually grow up to sea level like a modern, like a tropical coral reef does. So there's some, it's a, it depends on how you define a coral reef. And as a geologist, I define a coral reef as something that grows up to sea level. Because a reef is something you can hit with your ship. Okay, so we have coral, but not reefs. Exactly. Um, we've had a question from Nick. It's sort of like comparing the Amazon rainforest with the Caledonian pine forest. Both are forests, but they're very, very different. Gotcha. We've had a question from uh, Nikki on YouTube who's uh, asking whether we can kind of seed coral reefs or farm coral. Um, yeah. 
somehow with artificial this is, means. This is an area of very active research. Um, and there's groups all around the world doing this and they're growing corals. They're, uh, my colleague, Jamie Craggs at the Horniman Museum in Southeast London has corals right. in, in London. There's corals being born in London today, not today, but you know, this year. <clears throat> and they they can get they, they get them to spawn, they get them to settle, and then they get them to grow up a bit, and then you can plant them out onto the reef. So this is something that's happening in all different parts of the world, trying to regenerate reefs by culturing them. It's really amazing to to hear about all the different kind of strands and and, and avenues of of research that's going into how we can both protect the existing coral and also try and kind of jumpstart the regeneration process. Um, we had one more question, which is, uh, I'm looking for who asked it. Um, someone asked whether coral species would, will be able to adapt to changing climates because, you know, one of the problems we've seen with climate change is that, you know, animals can adapt to changing environments, but the, the environment's changing very, very fast and evolution's kind of slow. What about corals? Well, again, the changes are very, very fast. And so... I guess one lesson we can take from the fossil record from the past is there was a time in the past where the environmental changes were almost as fast as they are now. And that was in the Permo-Triassic interval. So this is between the Paleozoic era and the Mesozoic area, which is the time of dinosaurs. And there was some very rapid injection of CO2 into the atmosphere at that time. So temperatures in the tropics are estimated to have increased by 10 degrees centigrade. 96% of the species in the ocean went extinct. So they weren't able to adapt, they went extinct. The things that survived then re-radiated millions of years later to produce you know, things that are alive today. So in the past, there have been times with, with rapid warming and has created very bad situations. However, there's other times where there's been rapid warming and it hasn't been quite so bad. So as paleontologists, we need to study these different intervals and see what was causing the different responses. And hopefully and we, learn from that. Sorry, what did you say? I mean, hopefully learn from the past responses, you know, what might happen in the future. Yeah, and uh, in the meantime, we can just cross our fingers that we're not in a Permian-Triassic type situation. Because even if we're in the, you know, percentage of species that survive a mass extinction, we won't survive for long without all the others. No, it's true. Yep. Life will still continue on Earth but it's whether we continue. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm aware that, you know, it's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster this morning. Um, you know, we've, we've taken some ups and downs. We're having a bit of a, bit of a pessimistic bit at the moment, but what hope is there for the future? We, you know, we've got these, you know, these, these marine reserves. Um, what kind of state are they in? We've got the <laughs> research, we've got your work. We've what? got increased use of renewable fuels. We've got, you know, things are changing. It's just whether we can change it fast enough. And like I said, what we really need to do is find the places that are likely to be to, to persist and be resilient and protect them the best we can. And that's what our work in these turbid water reefs is, is hopefully going to lead to. So we're hoping that everything will be okay in these reefs. And so we need to really take care of them. Well, hopefully, then we'll be continuing this uh, this positive trend. We've just had news today that for the past two months, the UK hasn't burned any coal for its electricity generation. So that's a step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, we'll, we all have to make the small individual differences we can, like choosing where and how we go on holiday and stuff. But we also have to make sure that we keep pressure on governments and companies to, to do their bit as well and to mitigate the, the global threats to the whole environment, not just the coral reefs. But thank you so much, Ken. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, and yeah, please can you continue your really important work. Well, thanks so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. So thank you guys at home as well for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please do join us again for more Nature Live shows at 12 noon on Tuesdays and 10.30 a.m. on Fridays. Keep an eye on our social channels. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Insta, Twitter, and YouTube as well as nhm.ac.uk. Until next time, that was Ken Johnson. I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live Online. Thanks and goodbye.
Thank you.